Glad to see Mama Ridge got back from her vacation, all right. Baby Moore got back from the hospital, all right. I'm glad to see all the rest of you got here, all right. Everybody was calling up today to find out whether we're going to have church. I hear folks riding. We're going to have church. We're going to have church if they're riding all up and down Linwood. If we, if we can get in here, we're going to have church. So you all have to call. Just see if you can make it. That's all. Now, I appreciate everybody trying to tell me how to get here so I wouldn't get involved. But I can, I get here. Don't you all worry. Our scripture lesson this morning was taken from uh, the book of Judges. I used it some time ago, two years ago, I guess, when the riots were taking place in Watts. Because it had to do with Samson. And Samson is a good biblical figure that fits into the framework of, of riots, rebellion. It's really strange when you think about it, if you look at the book of Judges, which has to do with early leaders of Israel. Now, Judges really were people who, who uh, presided, who uh, were executives over the young nation of Israel. They, they were called Judges at that time. They were the rulers of Israel. Now, Samson is included, the story of Samson is included in the book of Judges, Although he never really was a leader of Israel in the sense that he had a position or uh, people accepted him as a, as a leader, except in the sense that he was a leader in the, the fight against the Philistines. And the Philistines conquered Israel, and it says that because of the sins of Israel, the Philistines conquered Israel and ruled over Israel for 40 years. And during this period, when Israel was in bondage to the Philistines, Samson was considered one of the judges of Israel. That is, he was the outstanding individual in Israel. He was the one people looked to. He was the kind of a center, the, the outstanding personality. And yet he's different from all the other judges and essentially different because the times were different. The times were different. Israel needed somebody like Samson. I remember two years ago when the riot in, in Watts was going on, they had on the front page of Life magazine a young black militant with his do-rag around his head. And, you know, he was a symbol of what was happening in, in Watts at that time. And I said he was a symbol of what was happening in Watts in the same way that Samson was a symbol of what was happening in Israel. He represented rebellion against oppression. And so I selected the same scripture for today. Because that which started in Watts two years ago is now sweeping the nation. And the same kind of, of rebellion against oppression, which Samson represented in Israel, and which the same kind of uh, hoodlum character represents all over the country emerges as some kind of a peculiar hero because he does the thing which has to be done at a particular time in human history. Now, Samson wasn't any hero kind of, of person in normal circumstances. Normally, people would have uh, frowned at Samson. They would have called him uh, some kind of a hoodlum. They wouldn't have listed him in their religious scriptures as a judge of Israel. But during this particular time, he had what everybody wanted. He wasn't afraid. He didn't mind dying. 
He was emotional. He struck out against oppression. And everybody called him a judge of Israel. This is Samson. He married a Philistine woman, and he spent a whole lot of his time chasing around after Philistine women. He was just an ordinary kind of person, except he loved to fight. And when he got mad, he'd fight anybody, fight a thousand people. Even walking through the uh, countryside, he'd attacked by a, a lion, he'd, he'd, he'd fight a lion single-handed. He was that kind of a person. And so in a day when people were oppressed, they tended to look to this kind of a person for leadership. A riot becomes a rebellion when people tend to support the little group of people who begin some kind of violence. In America today, we have either riots or rebellions taking place almost, in almost every city across the country. Last night they had, had a riot or a rebellion in Kalamazoo. And those of you who visited Kalamazoo with me would have agreed with me, that was one of the last places you'd expect to have anything. But they were carrying on in Kalamazoo last night. They carried on in, uh, in East Harlem last night. That wasn't so hard to understand, and we've been wondering why, the, you know, why Harlem was so late. It had started in East Harlem, but they expected to sweep across all of Harlem. Please shot a little Puerto Rican boy. This is the kind of time in which we live, everywhere. And then last night we had our own riot here in the city of Detroit. Riot or rebellion. You pick your own word for it. I think what we've had so far is a riot. I think it's, it's been participated in by relatively few people. And the radio stations called me this morning and asked did I want to issue a statement asking people to cool it. I said, I've been trying to get people to do something that would make it possible to cool it for years and nobody paid any attention. I don't have any statements about cooling it this morning. I try to explain that if, if everything is all right in Detroit, if nobody is alienated, nobody feels oppressed, if all black people feel that there are other things that they can do to change the situation, if they are confident that they have alternatives to violence, then it's just a little thing that broke out and it won't last long. But if all black people in Detroit feel that they're hopeless and they're helpless, and there is no chance of solving the problem, that they can't solve it by the ballot, they can't solve it by economics, they can't solve it by organization, then you got a riot on your hands. You got a rebellion because black people then are going to join in because it's already been started. Then we'll find everywhere throughout the city, everybody will join in. But there is a, there is a thing there, you've got to have the attitude. And there is a difference then between a riot and a rebellion. A riot is a little group, and perhaps they're more interesting in looting than they are in freedom. But a rebellion is a community that has decided that it will no longer tolerate the kind of racial oppression that it's been forced to tolerate. And so across the country we're getting a combination. In some communities, they're right. Just little bands who hear about what's been happening someplace else and think it might be good to have one here. And in other communities, it's not a riot at all. It is a rebellion. People look around and they say, we're, we're tired of these slums. We're tired of all the conditions that we have to put up with. 
We're tired of the whole situation, and we're just not going to tolerate it any longer. And then a whole community erupts. And everybody says, we don't know why that happened. That's a rebellion. And more and more of these eruptions are rebellions rather than riots. Now, there's always going to be in anything such as we're going through now, any period of rapid social change. And that's what it really is. The conditions in America are changing more rapidly than ever before in American history. Now, in a period of very rapid social change, you're going to get all kind of people participating. And everybody who participates is not going to be a great uh, freedom fighter. If you start a fight on a corner because your freedom has been uh, transgressed, there's going to be somebody who's going to come up with just because there is a crowd there and pick all the pockets he can. Now that doesn't mean that freedom wasn't involved in the first fight. That just means that somebody else who was broke or knows how to pick pockets, utilize the situation. But when that happens, then we all stand back and we say, there was nothing going on there but some people picking pockets. That isn't true. And usually that's not true in a community, no matter how much emphasis is placed upon the looting, you know, the breaking into stores. Usually there are other things that are important to the people. And there are people who loot, just as there are people who do every other kind of thing that they want to do for their own personal satisfaction. Riots everywhere, rebellion everywhere. The Detroit News had a very interesting editorial yesterday. I think most of you probably saw it. They're talking about the, the, the civil rights rampages, wrongs spark riots, which is quite a big admission for the Detroit News to make. They say, why Newark, why Plainfield, or Buffalo, why these and not others? And they say the answer lies in a paradox, an upsurge in spirit and a lack of hope an upsurge in spirit and a lack of hope. The spirit reflects the change of the 60s in race relations. And this is the most interesting sentence. There were no such riots when Negroes everywhere knew their place. You know, that's true. There were no such riots when Negroes everywhere knew their place. As long as we had a place, and we knew where it was, the man had made it for us, and we were afraid to try to get out of it, there wasn't any possibility of a riot or a rebellion or whatever you want to call it. There were no such riots when Negroes everywhere knew their place. I point this out to show you that there is some good in what's going on. It must mean it must mean that a whole lot of black people no longer believe that they have a place. And whether you like the way, the expression that this new feeling takes or not, there is essentially a fact there that's good. I prayed for lo these many years that there would come a day when we wouldn't know our place. And if that's what's indicated throughout the country, that increasingly black people no longer know their place, then I say that's good. That's good. Now, if not knowing our place leaves us for the moment confused, so that we do some things that are not constructive in the sense of a planned campaign for freedom, then that's a part of the struggle an inevitable part of the struggle. There's some kind of struggle going on out there. (laughs) 
I don't want to embarrass any parent because we, we don't want any parent to stay home because they think the baby might disrupt somebody. There was another little article in the paper on rides too that you may have seen. It was Roy Wilkins holding forth again, his column Saturday. This is a very interesting column he has. He gives a very touching uh, description of a scene. Two little boys sat with their mother and father in the National Airport in Washington, D.C. after one of the nightmare nights of the Newark, New Jersey rioting. Both handsome and under 12 years of age, one slept in a chair as he awaited a plane, but his brother greeted me with bright and alert eyes, a ready smile, excellent use of language, and the now old-fashioned courtesy toward older persons. Their suits were linen and their ties were attributes to their mother's taste. The father is an officer in the Air Force and the mother a college graduate. The family was on its way to West Germany by way of the McGuire AFB. The major said quietly that he had done a stint in Vietnam and was looking forward to Germany. I presume he's talking about uh, uh, black family. The father's in the army, good position. He'd been to Vietnam, killing Vietnamese. Now he's on his way to Germany, and he's sitting in the airport in Washington, D.C. with his two little well-dressed, clean, bright little children. It's a beautiful little picture of, you know, the kind of family everybody thinks they want. Sunday night, while in Plainsville, New Jersey, a white policeman was being brutally stomped and shot to death. This is another Negro family now. A Negro father and his two sons were strolling the observation deck at LaGuardia Airport. The boys, like all boys everywhere, were zooming with each jet takeoff, and they hovered with each helicopter that settled down, and it made its way to the gate. Now, he's picked here two middle-class, bourgeois, Negro families. Put them both in airports, because that's a sort of a, you know, a status thing right there. They're in the airport. This one at LaGuardia, apparently, the father just brought his two little boys out so they could watch the jets take off. And they were two fine, manly little black boys, too. Negro boys, excuse me. And the, fair, the ones in, in, in Washington. And he, Roy Wilkins is very much concerned that all this riot and turmoil and fighting is going to hurt these little boys. You know, these nice little boys in Washington, D.C. and in LaGuardia. That all of this stomping policemen in, in Newark is going to rob these little boys of their chance, of their opportunity, their hope, their dignity. That all these hoodlums, you know, carrying on in Newark is really hurting these nice little colored boys. And he is apparently primarily concerned about these little bourgeois middle class boys. He doesn't say one word about the fact that a little black boy was killed by the policeman in Newark because he didn't have on a little linen suit and his clothing and all the rest of it was no tribute to his mother's uh, good taste. He was just a little black boy who lived in a slum. And a riot was going on and he was running around trying to see what was happening. And the policeman shot in his fear and he killed him. And crowds of black people stomped the policeman to death. But Roy Wilkins isn't concerned about that. He's just concerned about these nice little boys with the father who's dropping bombs in Vietnam. He doesn't like violence, but he doesn't see anything wrong with this middle-class Negro who's an army officer who can participate in complete wholesale violence in Vietnam. 
He doesn't see anything wrong with that. All he sees are these nice little children who are polite and well-mannered and well-trained and well-dressed. And he's going to evaluate the total struggle from coast to coast in terms of what it's going to do to these two little boys. Do you know in the total struggle, those two little boys are not the sum total of what we're fighting for? We're fighting for little boys who don't dress nicely, who don't know how to talk who don't know what manners are, who don't come up with what he, what he calls his old-time courtesy to, to old elderly people. Little boys who are nasty, who steal, who are darting around in the slums learning the hard way, who don't have any opportunity. That's what the struggle is for. These two little boys in the, in the airport, they've got every advantage that a black person can have, which isn't too much. But they've got the advantage. They got a little money, a little position. Where we want dignity is for those other little boys in Newark, in Harlem, Bedford-Stuyvesant, Birmingham, Detroit. We want dignity for all of those boys. Now that's what's involved in the total struggle. Not dignity for a middle class, a middle class black society. The NAACP has picked its role. It's going to be the spokesman for bourgeois black society. And anything that hurts that is going to be bad. That's Roy Wilkins' position. Anything that hurts that is bad. Now, a lot of you can say, well, that ain't too bad, because a lot of you figure you kind of identify with that anyway. He's identifying with that which is about gone. Middle-class black society cannot maintain itself and cannot free black people. It's impossible, essentially because they are selfish. They are concerned each about himself, about his own family, about his own little children, about his own job, about his own advancement. This is essentially middle-class Negro society, concern about self. They in a, in a rebellion, in a riot, a lot of people are concerned about things other than self. I'm not talking about the looters now, those who are trying to steal what they can and get it home for themselves, because they're just like the middle class. I'm talking about those who are outraged, whether it is a sensible outrage or an irrational outrage, those who are outraged at the indignities that black people have to live with. Those people strike out not selfishly, but because they identify with a group. They identify with black people. And a policeman doesn't have to shoot them before they are outraged at police brutality. A policeman doesn't have to beat them over the head personally before they become involved in a reaction against police brutality. In Newark, they stomped this little, this, this policeman to death because he shot a little boy. Now, that little boy didn't belong to all of them in a family sense, but in the sense of a nation, in the sense of a people, they were involved. They reacted, they responded, they were indignant. It's a complex thing, this struggle for freedom. And it's so easy after we get involved in the struggle to say, well, I think we've gone far enough now. Let's cool it. I got some of the things I wanted. 
I, I, I got my job. I, I've been promoted. I got me a poverty program job or something. Let's, let's, let's call it all off now. I got what I wanted. But essentially, what we wanted, what we wanted, what we were trying to get from the very beginning, wasn't something for you. It was equality for all of us. And when we once started it, about 13 years ago, when we once started it, there wasn't any calling at all. Now, you've been talking all this time about, I want freedom. Oh, I'd give anything for freedom. I'm tired of Whitey. I'm tired of him being on my back. Get off my back. I want to run my own community. You've been saying it. But it's harder to say it this morning because they're fighting on 12th Street. And it may be on your street by the night. You know that. It's not over by any means. And it's hard to say today that I'm for freedom and I think black people ought to strike back. I think they ought to fight for freedom. It's harder to say it now than it was last Sunday when they were fighting in Newark. Last Sunday we were all for the people in Newark because they were striking a blow for freedom. We said, ain't it wonderful what they're doing? And this Sunday we say, ain't them niggas crazy? That's what we say. There they go, just acting a fool, up and down 12th Street, robbing and stealing. That's right, plenty of them acting a fool up and down 12th Street. They're going to be acting a fool up and down Linwood tonight. They're going to be acting a fool all across town. They're going to be on Dexter tonight acting a fool all up and down, down Joy Road. They're going to be acting a fool tonight. But that was a part of what you started. You didn't think you are going to have a rebellion and a freedom struggle and nobody wasn't going to get hurt, did you? You thought it was going to go on everywhere else and then they're going to finally come to Detroit and say, well, y'all are black too. We're going to give you the thing that the other, other people have been fighting and dying about. We're going to give it to y'all because y'all were so good. All the things that was. It doesn't happen like that. When it started, it started for everybody. And you know, some of the people that, you know, now holler most about, about violence and everything, they had a part in starting it. You know, Roy Wilkins, he played a big part in starting it. He won't want you to remind him of it now. But when they start taking the, the, these cases to the Supreme Court, when they won, the NAACP won the educational case before the Supreme Court and outlawed segregation in schools throughout the South, that was one of the first gunshots of the rebellion. And he can say now that he doesn't like all this that's happening. But he had a big part in starting it. Because at that time, we didn't know what we were. We didn't know what the possibilities were in human life. We didn't know what we could do. The Supreme Court, when it said, you've got to give equal education, we said, well, we got to have equal education, a whole lot of other things we got to have, too. And then Martin Luther King, now he says he doesn't believe in a whole lot of stuff that's going on now. When he had the bus boycott in Montgomery, that was the second shot. When black people started marching in Montgomery and the white folks couldn't stop them, then black people all over the country said, look at here. Yeah, look at here. The man ain't got as much strength as we thought he had. That was the beginning of our change idea, a change conception of ourselves, and a change evaluation of the white man. Now, that was Dr. Martin Luther King with his Montgomery bus boycott. And then some people came down there and they said, we ain't going to ride in the back of the bus anymore. He had the freedom run. Oh, they burned up buses, they turned them over, they whipped black men and women over the head. But they didn't stop. You see, that's another shot. The re rebellion is going on. People's ideas are changing. And when your ideas start changing, the way you act changes. The freedom rides, the sit-ins, you saw the pictures. 
high, uh, uh, college kids, a few high school kids sitting at a lunch counter, white folks just doing everything. And they, they, they refused to leave. They were demanding, demanding equality, demanding that black people be treated like anybody else in this country. Those things went on, and we, we cheered all the time. Greenwood, Mississippi, mass demonstrations. Birmingham, you remember Birmingham, mass demonstrations. The dogs, the cattle prods. Oh, how we cheered them. But do you know that those people had to have gone through some big change or they couldn't have done that? Because, you know, a few years ago, a black man stepped off the sidewalk in one of those southern towns. If a white man act like that's what he wanted him to do, you know that. When it comes from that stage where you step off the sidewalk to a place where you're willing to march out and let dog, police dogs and police and everybody else try to fight you and you keep on, you've come a long way in your mind. I mean, your emancipation is in, the, is in progress. You are a different person. Now, when people begin to think of themselves in a different way, they're going to act in a different way. Black people start thinking differently. All along, it's been happening. Even in Detroit, provincial and backward as we are, we have been thinking differently in the last few years. You can see every issue that's come up, black people have reacted differently in Detroit. Not the same way they would have reacted five years ago or ten years ago. So we have been caught up in it. It's been a part of it. You remember the Freedom March in Detroit, where more than 200,000 black people marched down Woodward Avenue. Now, what happened at the end when they got down to Cobo Hall is something else. But they were marching in protest. That means even then we were in the process of changing. Our thinking was changing. Now, when you start this process, when you start black people deciding that they're going to be equal, that they are going to change conditions, that the white man is not going to keep them in bondage and slavery and oppression, that if he does, he's going to have to do it by force and power, then you got a whole new world is being born. That's what we're in the midst of now. When Stokely Carmichael screamed black power a little more than a year ago, he was only putting into a phrase, into a symbol, that which had been going on for 13 or 14 years. It had come to the place where the change had gone so far that you could take a phrase and say it. And so he said, black power. And everybody screamed, black power. And the white man said, uh-oh. Then the white man began to see, man, what, do, what do you mean by black power? What are you talking about? What is the philosophy of black power? But the white man knew that some big and basic change had already taken place. Or Stokely would not have cried black power and got a black power response. Now this is the kind of thing that we are in the midst of. Everywhere in these United States. You know, you look at the paper now and you wonder at the places that rebellions or riots are breaking out. Little communities that don't have, you know, enough black people that you would think to feel comfortable starting something. 3,000 in a community of 80,000. And they tearing up the town. But see, that 3,000 has been systematically mistreated and oppressed. And when they get ready to, to, to strike back, they don't always care whether they win or whether they lose. And this we've got to understand. Now, for most of you, you are rational. You are for freedom, for justice, for equality. You make rational decisions. You're going to fight for it in a rational kind of a way. You realize that there are certain things that you can do. But, you know, this freedom thing, it explodes in people's heads. And everybody's not going to be rational about it when he decides 
that they've been mistreating me for, for hundreds of years. My mom and my grandmama, they've been mistreating all of us, and I don't like it. They aren't all going to be rational about it. You saw, some, some of you saw the, the uh, report from the Black Power Conference in Newark. You saw those about 25 or 30 of them walk up the street, and they broke into the place. They were delegates, but they had had a little caucus. They decided what they were going to do. So they came, they broke in where the conference was having a press conference. And, you know, there were reporters and TV and all that. They, they broke in and just tore up everything. Kicked over the TV cameras and threw them all out the window. Ran everybody out and threw the chairs and furniture out after them. You know, just, just had a ball. They were expressing their indignation. You know, when you say, over a period of time, oppression comes from the white man. We want to get the white man off of our back. We want to have communities in which we have control. Black people have control. You say that over and over again, and for a lot of people, they say, I just don't have nothing to do with white people at all. Now, that's what those people that walked up the street, they didn't even want them in a separate room in the building in which the conference was going on. That wasn't rational. You can say they crazy if you want to, but that's a part of the thing in which we're all engaged. It was not rational. They need publicity. Publicity in the sense that they need to get out to black people everywhere the message about what they're doing. Now, we all know that the press and the television and radio won't take it out exactly the way it is. They're going to slant it. But that's about the only thing we're going to know about what they do there in Newark, isn't it? It's what we do read and what we see. Now, they could have set it up and used press conferences, send out material. They could have gotten a lot of information to us through the mass communication media. But these, this little group here, they call them, the, the, they were the young black militants. They held a caucus. They decided, we don't want them in there. We're going to run. So they just run in there. Whitey got to go, and they threw everybody out. Now, it wasn't sensible. But it's one of the things that you can expect as a part of this kind of a rebellion. Everything that happens in a rebellion is not sensible. You don't have to participate in all parts of it. You try to develop all of the sensible aspects of rebellion that you can. You try to give at every step a sensible alternative to violence. As we do here at Central Church. We believe in political action. Now, a lot of black people say, I don't care nothing about political action. That's just the white man's bag. Well, that's what he thinks. We have got to try to use political action because that is an alternative to violence. We have got to try to use picket lines, boycotts, all the things that offer the possibility of power without the necessity for violence. We try to do those things. That doesn't mean at the same time we've got to look with disdain on these other people who are fighting in some other way for the same purpose that we fight. We've got to understand it, that there, it takes all kinds of people to fight a rebellion. And a lot of them are not going to do it the way you want to do it at any single moment. And a whole lot of people are not going to agree with the way you're doing it either. It won't be too long before they'll be calling you Uncle Tom. Because unless you throw a brick, you must be a town. That would be a logical development, wouldn't it? But you understand that. You know what the situation is. You know why people do what they're trying to do. Because essentially we're trying to get free. And we want justice. And we are no longer talking about love and all these other things that cluttered up people's minds. We want justice, and we want to get it, we want to fight for it, but there are a lot of ways to fight. But because we fight one way, let's don't join in some universal denunciation of all people who are fighting in some other kind of way. The rebellion goes on. There's no halfway revolution. When it starts, it's going to go to its logical conclusion. Either we get free or we end up in concentration camps. You can understand that. There's no turning back, no stopping. You may wish you hadn't started, but you did. 
It's going on, and there's no way you can stop it. Now, you can try to utilize uh, uh, reason. You can try to channel power, but you can't stop it. Either we get free, or we end up in concentration camps. We are increasingly unnecessary to the white man. He doesn't need us. Economically, he doesn't need us. Politically, he wished we'd drop dead. It's not going to stop. So we've got to do everything possible to get free, because this is what we started out to do, and this is the process in which we're engaged. And you don't stop a process. It goes on. Thirteen years now we've been engaged in trying to break the black man's identification with white people. So a black man says, I'm a black man and I'm not ashamed of it. I'm a black man and I don't feel that I have to go along with anything the white man says. You know, that's been the process of the last 13, 14 years. Breaking our identification. And more and more it's being broken. Fewer and fewer black people are feeling that they are a part of the white man's world. Alienation, the understanding of oppression, the realization that the white man is an enemy against we, which we have to do some kind of battle if we're going to exist, if we're going to survive. All of these realities we have to face. There is no halfway revolution. I hope most of you saw the young man from Newark on TV who tried to explain what he thought they were fighting for in Newark. He was wonderful. He wasn't a leader, he was just an ordinary person. They picked him up, you know. He was in it. But he knew what he was fighting for. And maybe he did some looting, I don't know, you couldn't tell. <laughs> but he also knew what the freedom struggle was all about. He didn't give one wrong answer, and that's more than you can say for most black leaders when they get on television. Because they're always trying to say what, you know, not say too much, not make somebody mad. He didn't, he, he didn't say one wrong thing. Asking what he was trying to do, he said he was just trying to run all the white people out of the district. There was no equivocation about it, no, you know, saying, well, you know, this or that, running the bad ones out and leaving. The, he just run them all out. That's what he was trying to do. And he was going to just tap everything until he got them all out. Simple, clear-cut statement. That's what he was trying to do. All over the country, we get young men now who have an awareness of what the problem is, who are participating in a rebellion, who understand what the nature of the rebellion is. Now, they fight one way here, and they fight another way someplace else. But the rebellion goes on, and whether you want to or not, you are a part of it. The times determine our heroes. Just as in the book of Judges, Samson is considered one of the judges of Israel. Because he lived at a time when they needed that kind of a person. Fearless, strong, with a deep hatred for the enemy. And so Samson fought, and you've got to remember the end of the scripture lesson this morning. Sometimes you wonder, well, what does this, what are they trying to do? What, are they, what do they hope to accomplish? You remember when Samson was in the temple there, and the Philistines, the enemies were all around. They were filling the temple. They were making fun of him, robbing him of his dignity. And even they crowded onto the roof and the balconies everywhere. They brought him out because he symbolized something. He was the enemy. He was the enemy that they had fought against. The enemy that had humiliated them so many times, and they were going to humiliate him. They said, make sport of Samson. And Samson standing there in the middle of the temple, a little boy, you know, great, powerful Samson, a little boy brought him out, and they put him between these two big pillars that held up the temple. And his hair had begun to grow back because he'd been down there in the, in the dungeon so long. His hair had begun to grow back, so his strength had begun to come back. And so he asked the little boy to put my hands put my hands on the two pillars because he couldn't even see. You know, they blinded him. And the little boy put his hands on the pillar. He said he just wanted to kind of rest himself on the pillar. Now, when he got his hands on the pillars, he knew what he was going to do. Now, you may not like it. You may not agree with it. But Samson said, and he spoke right out to God about it, let me die with the Philistines. That's what he said. Let me die with the Philistines. O oh God, that I may be avenged upon the Philistines for one of my eyes. Let me die with the Philistines. You have to understand that 
indignation, anger, hatred, all of them stemming from systematic oppression can develop to the point where an individual says, I'm willing to die if I can take a whole bunch of them with me. That's what Samson said. That's the Bible. I'm not quoting out from anybody in Newark or Detroit. I'm quoting from Samson. Let me die with the Philistine. Then he bowed with all his might, and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people that were in it. So the dead whom he slew at his death were more than those whom he had slain during his life. This you're going to have to understand because this is a part of a rebellion. There are people like this in Detroit, in Newark, in New York, Birmingham, California, Chicago, who are willing to even destroy themselves if they can express antagonism, if they can strike out against oppression. And so the Hebrew people, the Jews, remember Samson is a great hero. And who knows, a hundred years from today, some of these very individuals that today we call hoodlums, who in their own way are striking out, we may remember as heroes. We don't know. But they fight the fight for freedom in their way, and we fight it in our way. And we are confident that God will see that freedom comes. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask thy blessings upon black men, women, and children in their struggle for freedom everywhere. Not only in our own community, in Harlem, in Newark, in Birmingham, in Chicago, everywhere throughout this nation, we pray that thy spirit, that thy strength, that thy wisdom be with these people as they struggle for freedom that they have a sense of the tremendous magnitude of that for which they struggle, that they seek to build on earth thy kingdom, that they seek thy guidance. Be with them everywhere to sustain them and to lead them. This we ask, and we pray that we may be identified with them fully, that we may be a part of the struggle for freedom, whatever form it takes and wherever it may appear, because we are one people, we are one nation, and we struggle for freedom for black people everywhere. This we ask in his name. Amen.